world is on the brink of going boom boom. This is our most desperate hour. Unless we make a stand here and now, we're gonna die. Now. Roll for initiative! Uh, our last campaign DLC, which is called Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon Keep. And it's basically, uh, Tina is sort of a dungeon master of a D&D type campaign, and you're playing through that campaign as the DLC. So we've got you fighting orcs and wizards and dwarves and stuff like that. Welcome, fine ladies, to your first session of the most coolest game in the world, Bunkers and Badasses! As your Bunker Master, I will be spinning today's tale of fantasy and- Wait, why the hell are we playing this kid's game? Oh, you know, maybe because- Shut the hell up, Morty! In addition to being able to just sort of break the fourth wall just in terms of what references we can make and what, you know, what kind of enemies we can have fight, because you don't generally fight orcs in Borderlands, mm. um, because Tina is controlling the entire campaign, we get to basically just screw around with the player whenever we want to. We can have her say, okay, here's a boss fight. Oh wait, I didn't actually bounce that boss fight really well. Here's this completely different boss fight or she can suddenly lock off or open new areas of the map. Basically the idea being that Tina has a lot of exuberance as a dungeon master, but she's not terribly like experienced at it. So she's not great. So uh, she's trying to come up with things on the fly to sort of make the experience better for you, but she's not always succeeding. We'll have later on puzzles that if you fail a puzzle too many times, she'll be like, ah, fuck it, here, and just give it to you, and you can punch your way through the puzzle that way or something. It's a lovely day in Flame Rock Refuge, a far cry from- Wait, didn't you just say the sorcerer messed up the town? Why would things be lovely? Uh, whoops. Uh, what I meant to say is, it's eternal night, and you hear spooky music, and the whole area kind of smells like butts and dead people. Are you kind of a big fan of Dungeons and Dragons, these kind of games yourself? Yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot of us are. That was, that was kind of why we all latched onto this idea is because generally when people do Dungeons and Dragons type spoofing or, or referencing, it's usually this very condescending, like, fucking Dungeons and Dragons yeah, yeah. nerds, go, you know, but uh, because we all like it, we thought we could be one of those, you know, rare voices that are saying, like, no, Dungeons and Dragons is really cool for this reason and this reason and this reason. And, and to us, it's all about, you know, hanging out with your friends and, and sort of growing closer through this weird shared fantasy adventure you've gone on. And so thematically, that's kind of where, you know, the four players, characters who are playing the game, Roland, or sorry, not Roland, he's dead, uh, Mordecai, Lilith, Brick, and Tina, they kind of play the game and they get to know each other a lot better and they, ha they make sort of, they have character arcs that, that change throughout the DLC. What's initiative? It says which order we attack in. I punch the initiative. What's going on? I wasn't paying attention. It's, it's so easy to do the, like, the Big Bang Theory, like, haha, we're laughing at you because you're a nerd, like, bullshit thing, and we didn't yeah. want to do that. So there's definitely a bunch of fourth wall breaking jokes and there's definitely a lot of jokes that kind of, you know, need a little bit in certain aspects of nerd culture. Like we have a whole quest that's called Fake Geek Guy where uh, Mr. Torg uh, basically has to defend his right to be a geek because he's a hot dude that takes care of his body and nobody respects uh, dudes like that. Um, but that said, it's coming from a place of like, no, we really like this culture, we're a part of this culture, we're not being patronizing, hopefully. Now, pick your characters. You got the Necromancer, the Commando, the Siren. Siren. Dibs. My siren's name is Brick, and she is the prettiest. Ben Cabrera was the guy who made all that, that the, the enemies and stuff like that, amongst other people. Uh, we've got you know dudes like uh, Ben Perkins and all those guys. Yeah. Uh, and for them, I think it was kind of cool because basically you don't have to be tied down to, I say logic like Borderlands has a shitload of logic, and it really, I mean, we're kind of an over-the-top game. But you, even in Borderlands, you couldn't have a, you know skeletons. You can knock their heads off, and they'll continue to attack, mm -hmm. but in a really confused way, like they won't know where you are, and right. you know we have wizards that'll, you know, cast big crazy ass magic spells that you have to dodge and all that kind of stuff. It, it basically freed up uh, our ability to change the combat and make it feel a little bit different than the other stuff you've seen in the other DLCs. You're not fighting robots anymore. It's all new enemies. We have more new enemies than the other three DLCs combined and all that stuff. I am Mr. Pony Pants Guy! Yeah! Writing this DLC especially was really fun because since the plot of it, because basically the plot of the game, since it's so big, has to be like, oh, the world's ending and blah, we have to stop Handsome Jack. Yeah. And when you meet characters in that context, they kind of only have so many different emotions they can have, you know, uh, that doesn't really allow them to just sort of be themselves and be calm. Uh, but since this DLC is basically just about hanging out with them and playing a game of Dungeons and Dragons, I got to write a bunch of conversations that were just about, like, there's a whole quest that's just about how Lilith and Brick think the Game of Thrones books are better than the TV show, and how Tina doesn't like eating salad, and like all these things that would seem really banal and boring in any other context. Since that almost never happens in Borderlands, I hope it, it hopefully feels kind of special to just have them hang out and, and sort of shoot the shit, because you never got to really get much of that. Yeah, and you get to write a lot more for Tina as well, who, who must be a favorite character for you, right? I, I, yeah, I mean, I like her, but I also have to try to, you know, keep that in the back of my head. Like, hey, she's your sister. That could be really nepotistic if you're thinking that she's a really good character. <laughs> now, I was not actually the one who suggested that Tina be the main sort of character of this campaign. That was uh, Raisin Varner, our audio guy. But yeah, she's spectacularly fun to write for, if only because, again, the voice actor who is my sister 
always knows what kind of jokes I'm going for because we have really similar tastes and humor, so she can just pick up a line and then do it once and be like, yeah, that was, that was great. Now just do it like it's a song and sing it weird, and then she does that in the frame. You've entered the town of Flame Rock Refuge. In the distance, you see the town's scouting blimps, always alert in case of battles and stuff. What you gonna do now? So will we be seeing any other characters from the main campaign, like Trap Trap or any of the other oh, characters yeah. that will be showing up? Yeah, one of the things that's kind of cool is that since Tina is kind of using this whole campaign to sort of reflect on the events of the main game. It's almost like this epilogue to the whole main game. Um, she brings in a lot of characters from the main campaign, but they have this little twist to them because they're how t Tina sees those characters. So you'll see Handsome Jack, but as Tina sees them. You'll see Angel and Roland and Claptrap, but as she sees them. Roll for initiative, suck up!